It's good to see you. Good Thanks see for you joining too. us. Thank Sit you down. for having me. Yeah. Well, as you may have been told, we're going to do a series of questions, mm -hmm. but very conversational, very simple. Let's do it. Okay. Um, what, what would you like to know about this project? Well, I guess first and foremost, you know, what even made you want to like leave the corporate world and, you know, leap into the world of filmmaking and making a documentary? You know, this is obviously a huge change. So, you know, what made you want to do that? Well, you know, after 20 plus years of, of being a successful uh, vice president in a large national corporation, I was, it was the clock that did it. You'd go through this inventory of your life and all the things you wish you had tried. I've always wanted to do film. If I was ever going to do anything in film, it needed to be very quickly. Yeah. I didn't have another 20 years or who knows. Right. That, one of the themes of, of this whole film is about storytelling um, and how important storytelling is so that we learn from the people that tell stories to us. A lot of the stories that I see coming from women are um, young women who are blogging or something like that online. I see a lot of those, um, but I haven't seen too many older women. Like, women who are, you know, over 60, I don't know where I would like, I mean, I could probably Google one of their stories. So you don't see it in front of no. you? No. Yeah. No. I mean, yeah, I think it would be really cool to see, like, more older women, like, putting their stories out there, like, through, like, the internet or social media. Um, I mean, that would definitely be something I would be interested in, in seeing. And I think, like, a certain sense of, like, like wisdom and like insight into situations would be lost without those stories. And the whole idea with this project was to bring those women's voices to the forefront and bring them in front of people who might be kind of shocked to hear what it is that they're doing and how old they are. Um, and then maybe prompt them to go find some other women to speak with, you know, that are older. Storytelling takes on uh, different levels and diff you know different parameters all the time. It's so much more of a connection to the bigger world. And the connection becomes greater when different people share their stories. So thus the Beyond 60 project. We did not live near anyone. We were in a very isolated area. The nearest neighbor was about a mile away. Everyone kind of cooperated with everyone else in that, and back in that day and age. Back then, we looked after each other. Forgiveness is the key to any tragedy or any misunderstanding or misfortune that you encounter in your lifetime. Everyone labeled him as being strange, different, not normal. And then I learned after three or four days that this person had a real mental illness problem. On May 11th, 1966, I was leaving the high school around 3.15, arrived at the entrance to my home, the bottom of the lane, somewhere between 4 and 4.15. And shortly after getting off the bus, about two or three hundred feet from the bus stop, I was, I was approached by a man who came out of the bank on the left-hand side from behind a tree. He had a mask and he had a sawed-off shotgun. He grabbed me by the neck and he pointed the gun to the kids and he said, you're mine, I'm taking you, tell them little bastards to leave or they're all gonna die right here. And he grabbed me by the neck and drove me into the woods with him.
and that's women, women's history. That's all women, 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 women. Yeah, that's a lot of women stuff. Some business. And I, you know, and I'm the as the as the girl, and I mean, I don't know that this this is not necessarily true, but I think in a lot of families, it's the women who are the keepers of the family story. Um, newspapers, photographs. So I, you know, I have a I have a lot of stuff, but it's you know you need. That's why I'm never writing another biography like this again because I. I can't go through this again. But this is sort of the mission. Yeah. You know, this is the mission. I started knowing who these ladies were before I knew their name. I was born in Chicago. We moved to Indianapolis, which is where both of my parents had grown up. So I was three years old. So we're in this apartment and it's my grandmother's room. And I just remember as a little girl that I would go in that bedroom and there were ostrich feather fans and opera glasses and photographs and you know the Shalimar perfume that my grandmother wore was still infused in the fabrics that were in the drawers and we had um, you know the silverware that Madam Walker that had Madam Walker's monogram was the silverware that we used every day in the china for special occasions so I knew about Madam Walker but it was kind of a larger than life figure and in some ways, a little bit of a burden for a kid because there were some people who would say, oh, you know, you think you're this and that because of Madam Walker. And I'm like, I don't even really know what that means. And so I didn't really embrace it. And my mother, who had grown up with everybody identifying her in that way, didn't want that to be a burden to me and so didn't make it a big deal. So we didn't sit around the table telling Madam Walker stories. She wanted us to follow our own dreams, and my passion was writing, something that I sort of got in the bug when I was eight years old, and they really supported that. I still was kind of ambivalent about Madam Walker, honestly, because this was the era of afros and not straightening your hair, and there were many people who identified Madam Walker as the woman who invented the straightening comb who wanted to make black people look white. So I was like, I don't really know that I want to deal with that. You know, and for me, the irony is that I ended up telling the Madam Walker story after many years as a journalist. I think that the number one responsibility you have to yourself, you know, in this lifetime, however long that may be, none of us know, right, is to get in touch with the things that really inspire you and make you happy. I'm not sure what led me to art uh, specifically, other than I feel like it was something inside of me that just was always there. But I also got, um, when I was in later in high school, involved and in, had an interest in medicine. I think my dad was like, well, you know, you know, you love art, but you should be doing something more practical. I was like, all right. You know, honestly, you know, I go to microbiology class and my head would be spinning. But then at a certain point, I was just like, I really want to um, pursue art. And I remember having this conversation with my mom. You know, and she was like, look, if that's what you really want to do, you know, I support you. I'll talk to your father. <laughs> Even though when she was young, what she really wanted to do was she wanted to go to medical school and become a doctor. And my grandmother, who was, you know, also very interesting, she went to Parsons School of Design and was in fashion, fashion world. When it came to my mother, she sort of really pushed her into getting married and having a family. The example of her not really doing what she wanted to do was partially my inspiration to make sure that I always did what I wanted to do. I think in my second year, I took a sculpture class and I knew immediately once I, I got involved in that, that that's what I wanted to be doing. When I was younger, there was a lot of messaging about, um, you know, you need to be at this place by the time you're that age, or you need to be at that place by the time you're this age. 
I feel like when I was younger, I kind of sort of bought into that. And I, I really believe that um, there is no prescription for how to live your life. And if there are any times I was, try, you know, was sort of sent down a path to divert from that, it usually wasn't of my own doing. It was someone saying, oh, you know, you should do this, or, you know, you can't be an artist, you'll never make any money. You know, what's the point of that? And um, somehow, miraculously, Women's voices tend to be associated more with, you know, just giving information and compassion. And uh, so we're associated a lot with health care and, you know, fashion, cosmetics and things like that. And also uh, telephone systems because, you know, traditionally the operators were all female. When I was a kid, that was my favorite toy. How ir ironic that I would grow up to be the voice on millions of phone systems. When I used to just play operator. Oh, no. <laughs> I became the original voice of Siri in a very mysterious way. In other words, I don't know. <laughs> I had done some digital voice recording for a big company that became Nuance and uh, IVR company text-to-speech. And so I knew that I was recording for some kind of phone system. At that time, none of us could picture that the phone system would be handheld, a tiny miniature computer that would interact with you. And actually, Apple came in after the fact. You know, so they, and I don't know whether the original creators of Siri chose my voice or whether Apple chose my voice. So that, that remains a mystery. The original recordings were done in July of 2005, four hours a day, five days a week. And it's, it's very tough on the vocal cords in the sense that it's not creative speaking. And you don't change the pitch or the tone or the, the timbre or the pacing of your voice. Everything has to be read the same. Everything has to be read like this. You're reading like this. And you have a director and it's very, uh, it's very controlled and very restrictive. I found out that I was the voice of Siri because a fellow voice actor emailed me and said, hey, we're playing around with this new iPhone. Isn't this you? So I went on the Apple site and I listened and I said, yes, really? Yes, that's me. <laughs> so it was very surprising. On the one hand, it was extremely flattering to have been chosen uh, to be that iconic app and it was iconic because it was the first concatenated voice that sounded human and that was able to interact with you so it was definitely an I iconic thing so that was very flattering and uh, that part of it was was great but it's it's kind of uh, disconcerting to hear your voice in, in, in a device like that that's on you know distributed to millions and millions of people and uh, without you really knowing about it. Because your voice is very personal. Your voice is like your face or your fingerprints. And so on the one side, it was really cool. On the other side, it was like, gee, that's, that's kind of weird. Okay, now I think I'll make one for Zach. See, okay, so the pot goes down, go like this, Get the amount of foam you want by that. You know, how foam you want. Mm. My mother and father were not your average people. They were pretty uneducated. My mother was very childlike and fantasy oriented. She started having me modeling at three years old. One of the major lessons and traumatic moments in my life was when she had me on Princess for a day. But I didn't realize how traumatic this experience was till I start writing this book about my life. And that's the first thing I wrote about on a quiet deck in Connecticut in the forest. And I started crying and I realized that um, this was a very sad thing that she had me do. 
you know, uh, and the lesson was, you know, do anything to be known and to stand out and, you know, lie, do anything. But, you know, it's, I'm not going to be happy unless you become a princess. I guess it was New Year's, maybe it was 68. Our wild friend Margaret invited us. I came to the party after they left, and she said to me, guess who I met at the party? I said, who? She said, I met Claude Picasso, and I'm gonna introduce you to him, and you're gonna fall in love with him, and he's gonna fall in love with you. And then we went to the city, and uh, Claude opened the door, and I had never seen anybody who looked like him, and he was very dramatic looking. He looked very much like his father, Pablo Picasso. And the next day, Margaret called and said to me, Claude asked me for your phone number. I said, really? So about a, 10 minutes later, he called me and he said, uh, I'd like to take you to dinner. And I said, well, why don't you come to Brooklyn for dinner, even though I didn't know how to cook. And um, he said, well, where's Brooklyn? And uh, <laughs> so I told him how to get to Brooklyn on the train. And he came and, um, and we never left each other for the next three years. Well, when I introduced my mother to Claude, she said, Picasso? She had no idea who he was, or who Picasso was. And then I got her a book about Picasso's sculptures. Then she started to realize, oh, now she's a princess. Yeah, this is what I wanted, yeah. She did what I wanted. I went away with his sister Paloma to a, an island on a vacation. When I came back, he said, I want to marry you. So let's go to City Hall. Well, it's like in New York, you know, there's this, a group of people who have access to each other. And if you're not part of the group, you don't have access into that, that world of very famous artists, wealth, you know, interest writers. And every door just flung open in a second. But I felt something was very empty. And so I began to feel frustrated and curious about other people, other worlds, and I didn't feel there was something unreal going on. And Claude started to get very upset about all of this and threatened and felt that I was no longer, my allegiance was no longer with him. And he said to me, the student eventually leaves the teacher. So he knew I would leave, yes, and I did. This was taken probably four weeks after I was home and out of the hospital and back in school. Probably four weeks. That's not much. That's not I, was in a lot, I was in a lot of pain. Really? Oh my, you can tell, look at my face. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, painful yeah. looking. Oh, and he, th he thought that was because I was sad. I hurt so bad I couldn't hardly stand, stand on that bridge. I still had ulcers in the bottom of my feet about that big around. I mean, did everybody know? Who everybody you? figured that it was somebody from the Turnpike because the Turnpike opened about 10 years prior to my abduction. It was the most exciting and most colorful thing in this whole area. And we just assumed that somebody was coming off of that network of people that were sure. new in the area. It's a new, new place, a new adventure. And he was just stalking people and doing terrible things. No one knew that he lived here. And he said, now tell me who I am. And I did not know. He said, does the bicycle peep mean anything to you? He said, you kids make fun of me all the time on the school bus. And then I knew who he was. Now your goal is to do what I tell you to do. And I go to him one, this is like the third or fourth day, I said, what is it you want me to do? He said, do you know how to drive? I said, yeah. I had, had no driving training. But I figured it was a survival technique. I have to do this, I'm gonna to have to figure it out. And his goal was to get to the golden egg. And I had no clue what that was. I'd never heard that phrase before. And during the conversation of three or four days of him screaming and yelling at me, I realized what the golden egg was. It was a turnpike. And I learned that when we got to Sydney's Knob, um, there's a cave there on the top which overlooks the turnpike. And inside the cave, he said, reach in there and get me that can and don't do nothing else because I'll shoot you right in the back. 
and I pulled out this can and it was an old rusty can and it had been there a long time. He took an old rusty hunting knife and he charred it open with a knife and he goes, well, I guess you're gonna eat today, blue eyes. And he put three peas on a bladed hunting knife and stuck them in the back of my throat and turned the knife. He said, can you feel that? And I said, yeah, I can feel that. And he said, well, blood can come at any time, you better swallow. And that's the only food that I recall ever having or seeing. Every day was more violent than the day before. And the more intense it got when he killed Terry Anderson, the anger and the beatings in his demeanor changed completely on day seven. And he shot Terry Anderson within 18 feet of me. Terry Anderson was an FBI agent who was sent here for the search from Philadelphia. He was 44 years old. He was the father of four. And after that happened, Holland Ball's rage was manifested to really out of control. He was running around talking in tongues. It was like a raging maniac. He had such an evil mind of just killing people. You saw me kill one, I'll kill more. That was the um, day, seventh day, that I was with William Hollenball. The following day, I was rescued and Mr. Hollenball was killed. And he was shot immediately by the officer who came from behind the house. And that's end of story here. I am very lucky that I graduated from college at a moment when doors were opening for women. Um, when I talk to young women, they have no idea that there was a time women couldn't get credit cards in their names <laughs> or when you couldn't, there couldn't be a woman CEO or, you know, so, so I, lots and lots of doors opened up both for me as a woman and as an African American. When I was at Columbia, my advisor, Phyllis Garland, the only black woman on the faculty, you know, we were talking about what my topic was going to be. And I gave her some really cliched, unimaginative kinds of kinds of topics like Fulton Fish Market, you know, something that a girl who hadn't grown up in New York would think, oh, this nobody's ever done this before. And at the end of the conversation, Phil said to me, um, you know, your name is Alelia. Do you have any connection to Madam Walker and Alelia Walker, Madam Walker's daughter? And I'm like, well, yeah, that's my family because, you know, I wanted to be me. I didn't, I didn't want to be somebody's great, great granddaughter only. And that was my only identity. But I said, yeah, that's my family. And Phil said, that's what you're going to write your paper about. So that's the fall of 1975. I mean, that was, you know, there was nobody else saying to me, Alilia, this is really an important story and you need to write a book and somebody's going to publish a book. But Phil sort of planted that seed, so I had begun to do some research. I'm still really, I got to make money. I didn't inherit, you know, I didn't have a trust fund. So I was, I was able to get a fellowship from NBC that NBC sponsored. And that gave me a little foot in the door at NBC. Um, so when I finished, I was hired by NBC. You know, it was, an, it was an interesting time because it was, you never knew what any day was going to be. I kept a suitcase packed in my car. So you could be, you know, in the middle of the night, you get a call and you run to the um, private airport and jump on a plane and you didn't know where you were gonna be for the next week or so. I flew into Memphis. At the time I had a big Afro. And I went to the rental car place and the only car available was a red Camaro. So I'm driving from Memphis to Mississippi. I've never been in Mississippi before, but it's a beautiful spring day. It's a beautiful place. The wildflowers are blooming. I see a cardinal fly across. I'm thinking, Mississippi, all these horrible things I've heard about Mississippi, what a beautiful place, how ironic this is. So I arrive in Tupelo in my red Camaro. And you know, again, at that point, no cell phones. So the, I needed to make a phone call. You have to call the New York desk to tell them where you are. And the one place to make the phone call was a pool hall with the Coca-Cola machine and a bunch of old boys standing around. But my camera guys came in with me. I made my phone call. That evening we went to 
cover the rally. That was probably one of the pivotal moments for me that I, you know, I knew that I wasn't, I was safe because I was with people who were watching out for me, but it was also something that was very frightening. But it was really an experience for me to say, you know, you're a journalist, you're supposed to be able to go into a war zone, you're supposed to be able to go into a place that's uncomfortable, and you have to figure out how to navigate it. I um, covered the child murders in Atlanta, and I was the lead producer on that. I then um, was a producer on the Jesse Jackson campaign and on the Geraldine Ferraro campaign. So I was doing, you know, I was making my way up the, up the ladder. This was 19, summer of 1976. Women had just sued Newsweek and they had sued NBC and ABC because women, young women were hired as secretaries or researchers and they stayed at that level. And young men would be hired as associate producers or desk assistants and then they would become producers. And so a new bureau chief came in and he had been replaced by the first black woman bureau chief. We just really clashed. This guy really, he was mad because he'd been replaced by a black woman. I was ready to quit. I feel that these days there's probably a more equal mix, but for sure, you know, the art world, like the rest of the world, is has always traditionally been more male-oriented. I think that's no secret to anyone. <laughs> I've always wanted to have a very diverse studio that's able to explore all kinds of different techniques, use all kinds of different materials. And this is actually how big he was. This is his life size. Like, they very meticulously recorded all of his measurements. And I even had like Xeroxes of his hands so we knew how big his hands were. It's pretty amazing, right? Stand next. Yeah, that's look great. At that. I mean, I have big hands, but look at that. <laughs> pretty crazy, right? Then I had, you know, one assistant for a couple of years and then it just got, you know, we got bigger projects and needed more people and it just sort of grew over the years. We did a project for Lady Gaga a couple of years ago uh, that was part of her Fame perfume launch. And we've done a few projects for her. So, you know, now we've got this challenge. You want to need to make this giant transparent egg shape like her perfume bottle that also sits in a carriage uh, that she can get in and out of and there's a seat inside it, you know? And it's all attached to this actual carriage that is being shipped to us from Los Angeles. And when it gets here, is gonna be drawn by an actual horse. <laughs> so it's just like, whoa, you know? And all this has to come together in like 10 days. You know, all my cumulative experience and experience making you know, all kinds of different things, you know, kind of inform who I am and what I am today and what I am interested in doing or not interested in doing. It's fun to have stuff here in the city that you know, people can actually see and experience. So in phase three of the High Line, we were asked by Dillard's Video and Renfro, the architects, to help them develop a rubber material that resembled the beam forms and create uh, couple of levels and sort of in and out areas so that kids could use it as a player. And underneath all these pieces of rubber that we made are part of the original beam structure of the High Line. And they cut through and made this second level here so the kids could sort of go in and out. They have all these openings they can climb around. And then there are periscopes also that you can see different views of the city through. Even though I always wanted to, you know, live in different places and experience different things, I never really questioned what I wanted to do, you know, so that was always very crystal clear to me.
Lake Champlain was always you know, down the hill and you can see it from the top of the hill. And we would always walk down to the lake and look at it and sometimes we'd go swimming and stuff. And um, I ended up working there summers when I was going to veterinary school. I looked at the lake and said, I think I want to swim across that. That crossing is like between eight and nine miles. So we went and did our little adventure and swam across Lake Champlain um, in August of 1977. So I think that's the first time that it entered my head that I wanted to swim across something. My first job as a veterinarian was in Vermont. It was in the northern part of Vermont in a town called Newport. There were farms that I would go to where I wouldn't be allowed out of the truck. I'd be met at the truck by the farmer and he would tell me to just leave. And I would counter that with, so you're going to just let the cow die and not have anyone look at her? And he says that he would prefer that to having me. After three years, the um, veterinarian I was working for decided to finally have a contract drawn up. Some of the stipulations in the document weren't what I was expecting. And the lawyer that I was consulting said, well, if you take a stand because you feel this strongly, what's the worst that could happen to you? And I said, well, I could lose my job. And that's exactly what happened. And uh, I was five months pregnant. So I was going to have a baby at the end of that year. And I started working out of my um, living room, you know, taking large animal calls and having people come see me. And then um, toward the end of that year, I, I talked to my in-laws who ran a business called Martin Snack Bar um, and said, you know, what would you think about me turning that into a, an animal hospital? It was one of those things where I think the, the moment was driven by necessity. I just was uh, responsive. I didn't really have a lot of background in running a business, so I basically Figured I'd enrolled in the School of Hard Knocks <laughs> because you do make these bad decisions or mistakes because you just don't don't know any better. And like one example, which is a very minor example, is um, I got employees, and there's this thing called withholding. And then you know, after a little bit of time, the government wants what you withheld, and I said, "Oh, where is that?" <laughs> we grew steadily. Yep. We started getting busier, and then um, I had a veterinarian call who's, who said, um, are you looking for another veterinarian? And I said to her, oh, what an interesting idea. <laughs> so we did keep on um, growing. I mean, it was, it was always steadily growing. Um, and it was 15 years when we decided to expand into a bigger building. During my young child rearing and building the practice, I wasn't swimming nearly as much as I do now. I think back then I might have been too busy to swim as much as I do now. When I told my husband I was going to swim the English Channel, he says, I, Paula, that window has closed for you, you know? <laughs> and I said, what, do you, what does that mean? He says, well, you're too old to do something like that. To say something. I don't want to make any mistakes. It's too important. How do I get what's in my head and after my voice? I mean, our voice. Our voice. Begin with the truth. What if I don't have anything to say? What if they listen to what I have to say and hate it? Flet wants you to listen to her, pay attention to her, and consider her ideas and opinions legitimate. Flet wants people to stop bullshitting her. Flet wants you to forget how old she is and remember how young her mind is. This is me in Sweden. <laughs> yeah. That was the beginning of the year. And so my junior high school and high school years were my quest to find people I belonged with, people who were like me, who would accept me, because the cheerleaders and the football players and the, you know, the larger population was, I was nobody. And so I was always trying to be 
accepted and fit in. And I didn't embrace being different until much, much later in my life. I applied to be an exchange student because I wanted to leave home. I saw it as a way to get out of Dodge. <laughs> I went to Sweden. I, I lived in um, Gothenburg, but it's pronounced in Swedish Göteborg. And I didn't mind being the outsider. I, I, before I went to Sweden, I wanted to fit in. When I came back from Sweden, I didn't care. I think being an exchange student, even though I made some errors in judgment over that year, um, showed me using your imagination, you could accomplish a lot. That was the first place I ever went where I, I was embraced and I didn't, I wasn't looked down on for being different. I ended up getting my degree in fine arts in drawing. I was an art, assistant art director on a magazine at Rodale Press. I worked as an artist, a board artist for uh, New Jersey Magazine. I knew that's not what I wanted to do for the rest of my life was art. I, and I took an acting class and that was it. I knew immediately. I, I was in the classroom for an hour and it was like I found my passion. That's it. Long story short, I got accepted into the first graduating class of the Masters of Fine Arts program um, at the Actor Studio Drama School at the New School, and that's where I went. I graduated in 1997, and I was the first class that graduated from that program, which is now pretty well established. All my acting teachers were trained by Lee Strasberg. And so they had to study with him and they also had to be members of the actor studio, which is a very closed club. And then we would have master classes with people like Estelle Parsons and uh, John Patrick Shanley, who is a playwright that I admire and was mesmerized by him. And Sidney Pollack and Sidney Lumet and Sally Field and Jessica Lang and Paul Newman, who I got to do a scene with in graduate, I mean, it was like, you couldn't ask for anything better. I try not to say I'm sorry anymore. And sometimes I do let it slip and then I say, I'm not sorry. I give myself more permission. I, uh, I say no more to things I really don't want. And I say yes more to things I really do want. Um, we're taught from a very early age as women what's wrong with us. And I try to embrace what's right with me. So that leads me to where I am now. A show for the Philadelphia Fringe Festival. It's a very special place to live. You feel like you're in New York and not in New York, you know? And um, I like it. I like the contrast, you know? I guess maybe getting older you do want something sometimes more peaceful. That might be one of the indicators of my age. <laughs> there was a certain power to having that name and giving up that power. I didn't know exactly who I was going to become. And I knew that I wanted to give the name Picasso up. And several people said, don't give that up. You could sell things. You could, it, it could be to your advantage. And there, could, there were advantages to keeping the, the name. Um, Andy Warhol couldn't believe that I was, wanted to give up the name. You know, there was something that was missing that I wasn't really totally connected with who I really am. And so I eventually met my second husband, Bill Lavner. While we were working at the same office, uh, the, these neighborhood little uh, directories, uh, blue books, Bill and I got married. Um, and we had this, uh, we lived in the village and Bill was a publisher and um, we had this very nice life. We traveled. He was. A, brilliant at frequent flyer miles, so we traveled around the world. We eventually found my children's birth parents and went to Korea. 
now the children were 16 and 14, and my husband started to walk funny. So the next day he went to St. Vincent's Hospital and um, the operation showed that um, he had a tumor on his spine and uh, it would have to be removed in a special operation. Eventually we went to another hospital and something happened during the operation. It was an accident and um, he was paralyzed. And I went home, poured myself some hot milk and cognac, drank it, went to sleep, and the next day I began my new life. to my husband, guess what? I'm going to join the Sun City Palms. And he looked at me and he said, over oh, my dead body. Well, unfortunately, he passed away. I thought, you know, he said over oh, his dead body, and maybe that means, okay, now go and join them. are a Sun City Palm, you got to be one tough old broad, really. If you want to be on there and you want to be on stage and you want to perform, you perform. It doesn't matter what's wrong with you. Yes, I hurt. It kills me to get out of it. And uh, it hurts all the way. But those girls are waiting for me and I have to get there. Then you get to the block that's mobbed with people. Nothing hurts anymore, because you got to put on a show for those people. started in 1979 as a cheerleading squad to a women's softball team called the Sun City Saints. They were having poor attendance, I guess, at these women's softball games, and I think they figured if they had some cheerleaders there, maybe they'd get more men to show up. So the Palms have been around, well, we'll be celebrating our 40th anniversary in a couple of years. You have to want to do it, and of course, if, if they didn't, they wouldn't be there. And you have the desire for perfection. You have this uh, desire to perform, and no matter what is bothering you, that desire takes over. Because you can be tired, you can be sick, you can lay down when it's over, but you've got to get through these performances. I think I started having symptoms of my arthritis in my hands when I was about 24. When the doctor told me that I would end up in a wheelchair by the time I was 45, and it, it scared me. I thought, I can't let that happen. That's too young. That's, I've got to keep going. And, and then it wasn't until I turned 62, the year I, I retired. I got up one morning, and I just fell. I, my, I just couldn't walk anymore. Today I am going through the breast cancer that I was told I was free and clear of after 10 years. Uh, it came back and metastasized into my liver. And stage four, it's in any type of situation like this, you have to have something that's important to you, something you like, that keeps you going 
and you say, well, I'm not going to give in and just sit around and do nothing because that's the worst thing you can do is sit and lay. And then um, I noticed my neighbor Greta, she would leave in these nice costumes and so I talked to her and she says, well, we do dancing. And I said, oh, I'd love to get back into dancing. I said, I don't know how well I would do anymore, but I sure would love to get back into dancing. So for about three years, I took really heavy doses of morphine. And um, one day I just woke up and told myself I had to come off them. I just had to find a way that, you know, I couldn't get up in the morning without having those by my bed. And, and I was trying to decide was I taking them because of the, an addiction or because I really hurt. And then I finally got down to one a day. And then finally one night I forgot to take it. And I woke up in the morning and thought, oh, I feel pretty good. So as far as resilience and age and what keeps you going, um, I, I give the palms a lot of credit. Maybe people say, ah, that doesn't mean anything. I do. It's that desire to do things that keeps us going. It's a motivation for me. And some of these elderly ladies that are 84 and in their early 80s, and I just look at them and go, they're amazing. And they, they, they really do, they inspire me to keep moving. And if we forget to unzip each other when we're done, then we, I get home and it's like, oh my goodness, I, who am I gonna get to zip me down? Well, I'm usually one of my neighbors are home. Things. I gotta get the iPod, that's the music that we march to. Too. And I volunteer a lot to different places, so I'm still out there and active, and that's all that matters. He had no upbringing, no rearing, no love, no compassion. No one hugged him and kissed him, told him they loved him. You cannot be of sound mind, make good decisions if you have hatred in your heart. I'm in the process of dedicating the rest of my life to mental health. I don't know what inroads I can make in that project, but I'm willing to donate the rest of my life and any money that I can contribute to that cause, I will definitely do that. We have to be more accountable for the mental illness in our, in our nation. And if I can be remembered as one thing and one person, I want to be remembered as being giving and forgiving. He cannot be responsible for his actions when he was treated so poorly. The system failed him and we failed him. I forgave him because it's the right thing to do. My mother was the fourth generation of women in her family to have worked for the Walker Company. And I think she grew up feeling that that was something she was expected to do. Uh, she majored in chemistry and business in college, but she didn't want to impose that on us. I grew up wanting to do, wanting to be a writer not wanting to do the same thing that my parents had done. I was able to approach the story in a way that was comfortable for me to tell Madam Walker's story, to discover things that others had really forgotten or never known about her. And I really came to it more through Alelia Walker, uh, Madam Walker's daughter, because she had uh, been part of the Harlem Renaissance and as in the late 60s as I was beginning to discover people like Zora Neale Hurston and Langston Hughes. I, my grandfather had those books. They had books that they had written. And so I became attached to that and fascinated by that because I loved to write and I loved those writers. So she was the person that I was really interested in initially. Madam Walker was too complicated. So while I was on the Radcliffe College um, board, one of the other um, board members was a professor named Nathan Huggins. And Nathan also happened to be an advisor for a series of biographies that Chelsea House Publishing 
uh, had created called Black Americans of Achievement. And they needed a Madam Walker book, and there had never been a Madam Walker book. And he knew that I was doing some research on my great-great-grandmother. Around this time, Alex Haley had come to us and asked about writing a biography of Madam Walker. Actually, and, and he wanted to do a fictionalized version. When we first started, he would say, baby, you know, baby, do this. And he said, um, make, a, make a file folder, a manila folder for every year of your story and just drop things in that folder and make some folders for the characters in your book and drop some things in the folder. So I now have thousands of folders because Alex told me how to organize it. I mean, it's just a little thing, but it makes such a huge difference. So now on my fourth book, I've got all of this material that I've been collecting really for the last four decades. At 23, I would never have thought I would have anything at all to do with Madam Walker. Phil Garland said, you need to write this story. Alex Haley came along. And then I saw the effect that this story had on other women, how inspired other women were by Madam Walker. And so that made me want to know more, made me want to, to continue to tell the story. Du Bois is my intellectual hero. And as I go through this old issue of the crisis, he has Madam Walker's obit. And Du Bois says great things about her. He was just full of praise. And I thought, well, you know, I sort of filed that away. And I thought, if my intellectual hero can find something good about this person about whom I'm ambivalent, then I need to re-examine it. That her uh, real thrust was not straightening hair, but changing hygiene and helping people heal scalp disease. And... But to understand that the um, caricature that had been created about her wasn't really accurate. And then I began to discover how uh, much of a political activist she was and how much of a philanthropist she was and how much she empowered women economically. So she became then, instead of this, you know, one little incorrect nugget that people repeated over and over again, she became this fully formed human being who really made a huge difference for women. And now I'm at the point where some of the seeds that I planted by trying to keep the story alive um, have now come full circle and I'm able to help the company and help the brand stay alive. And that will be there after me. So that leads me to where I am now. And I'm in the process of writing, rewriting a show for the Philadelphia Fringe Festival. I had, I had started and stopped and started and stopped this idea of a one woman show. It was based on this whole concept of me having this duality in my life. Um, the thing that I'm supposed to do and the thing I want to do. I'm confronting things in this play that I didn't want to confront before, because I thought I confronted them in therapy, quite frankly. Um, but I embrace them now. And my age has given me permission to say, this is me, and this is where I came from, this is what I'm doing, this is how I, this is my art. But it will feed into my um, resilience in that I can get back up there, I can get back on stage, I can perform again. And hopefully I'll be able to do more with that. And it's just another one of those things I can say I did it. You know, I wrote it, I produced it, I got people to collaborate with me and um, I can check that off. And maybe I'll write another one. I think the reason why we're so willing to allow ourselves to buy in to someone else and let ourselves go is because we don't, we don't have that self-esteem. Don't, we don't believe in our, we don't think we deserve it. We don't, I, we don't think we're good enough. And I don't know where that comes from I guess it comes from our upbringing. Where else could it come from? But the older I get, the more I see that I am worth it. So I don't, I don't lose myself anymore. I know myself and I trust myself. Um, 
really live by my gut in a lot of ways and I feel like you know that's what's led me to this place today is just sort of following my gut instincts and always trying to get involved as much as possible in things that really are gratifying and satisfying to me on a personal level um, and you know make me happy. I'm working on a series of pieces that are inspired by the illustrations of a, <clears throat> a German biologist named Ernst Haeckel. A lot of them are based on sea creatures. And then, so they're, they're inspired by him, but I think they're also inspired by my childhood, you know, growing up on the beach and seeing all these cool, crazy sea anemones and sea urchins and jellyfish. So I'm sort of trying to um, translate those into the third dimension. I guess in another 10 years, I don't see my life being that much different than it is now, only I hope to be, you know, less involved in the commercial work. So I don't feel that I'm ever going to really retire. <laughs> you know, my retirement is going to be, you know, doing my own work. <laughs> Starting in 2009, I was helping a friend train because that was her goal, to send the English Channel. One of the other support people was on the pebbly beach and said to me, are you gonna swim the channel? And I said to her, no, why would you ask me a question like that? You know, cause I don't know why I reacted like that. And she said, because I think you can do it. And so then I started to say, really? Somebody else thinks I can do something? The tide that I selected with my pilot for my English Channel swim attempt uh, was chosen as September 7 to 14, 2016. Um, was there ever a point during the practicing leading up to the swim that you didn't think you could do it? Oh, many points, because it's, it's not an easy swim by any means, and I'd had um, people I knew who weren't successful. One of the things that makes it such a hard swim is that you never know where you are. You know, so are you almost done or are you only part way? I mean, it's just, it's just a horrible thing. And I remember swimming and, and looking to the left where there was the vast ocean and sometimes you'd see the big, the big ships and then looking to the right and seeing my little boat next to me. And I would think, that's all right. I don't need to know where I am, I'm fine. Um, near the end when we were in the pitch black and the small boat was with us and the crew was shining a spotlight on the cliff wall. Um, my support swimmer would say, can you see the light? You see the light? Go for that. And then I'd say, okay. <laughs> and then I would go for it. And she said, the last 200 meters I swam, I swam um, doggy paddle. Um, she said, some of your clients might like to hear that. I remember telling people that it felt like crawling. And so in a way you are crawling in the water when you're doing the doggy paddle. And then when I got to there and, and slapped my hand on the face of the cliff, it was just, um, a wonderful feeling. It was just like, oh, and then my friend that was next to me, you know, squealed in delight and says that um, you are an English Channel swimmer, Paula, you've made it. So I became stronger and I had to take care of all the finances and everything and he w was amazing. He, he inspired everybody. Uh, he, he helped other people from Mount Sinai Hospital. He was funny. He read, he, he gave me all the information that I needed because he would read and he listen to NPR every day. And, um, he taught me more about patience and love and um, I didn't understand, I, I understand me more now because um, he died three years ago. And I even understand more now about some of the lessons he tried to teach me. My most poignant memories of Bill are when he would hug me. He couldn't use his hands, but he would take all his strength to hug me. And it was almost, I, I almost couldn't bear it because it was so poignant and so touching except you know I, I 
embraced it, but at the same time, sometimes I wanted to pull away because it was painful. So I finally revealed myself almost exactly two years later in 2013. One of the struggles that I had during those two years, I said, well, you know, this could go one of two ways. You know, oh, let's get her, she's Siri. Oh, let's not get her, she's Siri, she's everywhere. Corporations really seem to be quite possessive of their digital voices. They don't really want people to associate a person, uh, a face, you know, with, with the device. They want people to imagine, you know, uh, whoever they want to imagine that they're talking to. Well, it was kind of a strange thing because um, I never aspired to fame. I call myself accidentally famous. And so it was a struggle for me because I'm basically more of an introvert than an extrovert. Siri really jolted me out of my comfort zone um, and made me realize that I was capable of doing a lot more than maybe I was doing at that point. Um, suddenly, after not being on camera for many years, after the Siri revelation, um, I was on camera a lot. And I discovered that it was something that I did fairly comfortably and uh, just reminded myself that, well, you know, maybe you should just get out a little more and do more of this type of stuff. So uh, thus the Siri Sings band, you know, and things like that. So, But I think as far as uh, women aging, there's, there's something calming about reaching the 60s. All of a sudden you can just, I find myself, I'm more able to say no to things that I don't want to do. You know, it's like, you know, I really hate that. You know what, I'm just not going to do it. I can't do too much in here, but do a little bit. So, okay. <laughs> I don't want to break another light. So, is that enough? You still oh. got it. Okay. Where does my resilience come from? I just have to think that I'm darn lucky. I very often think, wonder what it's like to die. What do you feel like in the days or hours before you die. I'm curious. <laughs> uh, when that time comes, I say this, I don't know if I'll follow through on it, but I say I won't have any fear because I've had such a good life. So being 63 is such a blessing to me. My mother died when she was 46. My grandmother died when she was in her 40s. And so I really sort of sweated that for a while. Like, you know, am I gonna make it past there? Um, because it seems that the women in my family tended to die young. And so I feel like every year is a blessing and an opportunity. My idea about senior citizens changed after my mom died, after watching the last two years of her life, watching my dad care for her, watching how seniors are treated in the healthcare system, and without an advocate, how dismissed they can be, how important it is to advocate for seniors. I don't know, resilience, it's, it's part of being a woman, part of being not willing to give, it, give up the ghost and just stay in a corner and be what people think you should be. And, the only way that we grow is when we have to deal with something and solve a problem and get past something, even if it's failure. Failure and is, is a great impetus. I began to understand things on a deeper level about my life and what created me and what I created myself. You know, the challenge of learning to write now I have a greater appreciation of writing, an understanding of that. Um, being able to write something, I'm not a, the greatest writer, but I wrote a decent book that people seem to like and read quickly. Um, it, it's like, I guess, put a frame around what happened to me and why. And so now I can go on to, um, not a new book, but a new chapter in my life. Well, I've been traveling a lot. Because I was like, um, there was a certain level of imprisonment with my husband's being paralyzed. I was also paralyzed in a certain way. Even though he tried to give me a lot of freedom, 
it was limited and I did do some traveling, but I've been like flying like a bird. I've begun to date a little, which is um, at first very shocking. The first date I went on very, you know, within the last six months, I wasn't ready till then. I was like, a, like a 14 years old, I was nervous, you know. Um, but the great thing is how I'm different than 14 is that I know right away what I like and don't like. And if I'm interested in somebody or I'm not, and I don't, you know, have any qualms about saying no, which I did when I was much younger. I think you get definitely better with age and experience, absolutely. Um, I mean, how could you not? How could you not get better with age and experience? You know? At the age of 60, you know, you could be conceivably only at your halfway point or a little bit past your halfway point in life. So that's a lot of time left to do so. But I think I would tell my younger self that um, it'll get better in a week. You know, whatever you're dealing with, you know, give it that good week's worth of patience and things will be better one way or the other. I would say you are absolutely right to have tried to do the best job that you could do in whatever job you had. Um, that you should always go a one step farther, that you need to deliver not just enough, but more. But there seems to be this desperate need to hold on to youth as much as we possibly can. And I don't know that, that that's a very healthy thing. I don't think we want to hold on to our youth. We just want to hold on to maybe um, our youthful attitudes. I don't see myself um, retiring. I, I see myself as maybe being able to pick and choose a little more selectively about what I do. I see myself teaching, still teaching. I don't want to ever stop teaching. I don't want to ever stop acting. I always say I want to I want to die one of three ways on stage in front of a classroom or having sex. <laughs> I realize about myself. I know myself so much better. I have such a creative spirit that I will always have to create. And um, so what will happen to me is unknown. <laughs> but I'm very open to to the unknown. And that as long as you're not as afraid of that, I think things can happen. Where do you see yourself when you're 60? Ooh, that's a good question. That's a ways away from now. That's, <laughs> that's a little bit away. Yeah. Um, hopefully I'm still doing really cool things. I mean, I don't ever see myself officially like retiring or, you know, being done with working. I love having things to do. And so even if I'm 60, hopefully I'm still like healthy and good to go, but I'd love to still be able to run businesses, help other people, like I still see myself working. <laughs> I don't know what it's gonna be like. That's really scary. I think that, and I was not, you know, born when my mom was born, so I don't know how women before perceived aging, but I feel like now because things change so rapidly, I feel so unsure about what the world will be like and what, like where I will be in the world. And that is so daunting to me that when I hear that question, I'm like, but what is the world gonna be like? Like that mm -hmm. would change everything. Um, it could change everything for me in the next five years. Yeah, I would say I'm curious, um, but I definitely haven't like sat down and thought about it. And anything, any fears about aging? When I was younger, I was really scared to turn 30. Really? I was really scared. Um, and I think it was just my own vanity, you know, of mm -hmm. aging, of who I was 
going to be at the age of 30? What, what was my life accomplishment at that point? I don't know. I feel like I think about, I almost have like, think about too much, like obsession with, you know, what am I going to feel when I'm, you know, five, 10 years now? What am I going to feel when I'm 40? Like, how am I going to get there? And is it going to be what I want it to be? I get really frustrated when people talk about age as, um, as being this bad thing because everyone gets older. <laughs> everyone experiences that, and, and if, if not, then that's even well, it's more much tragic. Better, yeah. Much better than the alternative. Yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I really resent that women's like value is so perceived by like their age. Yeah, I think that I agree. older people in general are underestimate it because they've gone through so much and you have so much to learn from them yeah, yeah that's what I found with my grandparents so I love it when I see women of any age especially like above 60 saying no I refuse to go under I refuse to become invisible quote unquote like I'm gonna be louder like I'm gonna really advocate for myself and women like me you know like when I get older like am I just gonna lose like my voice to tell stories too. So yeah, I mean, I think it's really awful because I think that there's so much like to hear from older women. Yeah. Young people have to stop thinking that like older women are just like, you know, jaded and like not interested in their lives and right. older women have to like meet us halfway too and, yeah. you know, not think that we're just like stupid and attached to our phones and like exactly. always thinking about the internet. Like we are smart, we care, we want to know, we want to empathize with your experience too. And I think like that is, yeah. About everything. Do you feel like you've learned from the women that you've interviewed? Absolutely. You know, each of these series of interviews have given me more insight into who I am and what I'm doing and why I did this. And it gives me this stronger sense of how important women's stories are. Because if they can affect me, they're going to affect other people uh, that hear the stories and affect in a in a positive way that will make you think about yourself and, and really challenge how you think about anything. Thank you.